Hey friends, we're going to continue our Rightly Dividing series with the next video here. And in today's video, you're going to watch an interview between Christopher Maskey from the Last Call to Calvary YouTube channel and Pastor David Reed from the Columbus Bible Church YouTube channel. The links will be in the description box below. You're about to learn a great deal about rightly dividing the Word of God and it's just going to revolutionize everything you know about the Bible. What does it mean to rightly divide the Word of God? What is the revelation of the mystery of Christ? Did the body of Christ begin at the cross? Did the body of Christ begin at Pentecost? Is the body of Christ spiritual Israel? What books in the Word of God today do we look to for instructions for us today as members of the body of Christ? Are we found in Hebrews through Revelation at all? Is there only one gospel? Where will we spend our eternity as members of the body of Christ? Are we going to rule and reign on earth as part of the priesthood? Is the body of Christ going to be a priest or are we a king? Are we going to walk through the, the 12 gates of the, the New Jerusalem? What exactly does being a priest mean and who's that for? Is that the body of Christ? Did the new covenant start yet? Are we living under the new covenant right now? Is repenting of sin and confessing your sin necessary for salvation? Are we going to be here within the new Jerusalem? Because we received the Holy Spirit, does that mean that we have the law written on our hearts? Is the pre-tribulation rapture biblical? Where exactly are the Old Testament saints now? So when we are in heaven, we are going to be judging angels. Is, is This is something that's biblical. But what does it mean that we're going to be actually judging angels in heaven? The pre-tribulation rapture, can we, can we rest in knowing that one day this glorious day, that this blessed hope of ours is going to take place? Do you believe that Christ is sufficient, that he did all the work for you. When I came upon Right Division, it just, the light came on. Right Division clears up all those questions. So we now know the, the clear gospel is, is trusting it in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. All right, so we are live. Uh, for anyone that is tuning in right now, my name is Chris. This is Last Call to Calvary. Um, tonight, we're going to have a special guest on, someone that for the last couple months has been a true blessing to me, has helped me out with my walk and understanding the word of God rightly divided. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 7 says people are ever learning and, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, so hopefully tonight we're going to get people that are in that state where they're, they're learning, they're eager to learn the word of God. They want to get the, the discrepancies and what seems to be contradictions down. We're, go we're going to get to the truth, hopefully rightly dividing the word of God. Um, so I'm going to introduce you guys to a brother. His name is David Reed. He's from Columbus Bible Church. Um, like I said, he's been a huge blessing to me. For anyone that's been wondering where I've been or why I haven't been putting out any content, I actually took down a lot of my old videos was because um, the Lord has brought a lot of brothers in my life and showed me some things and has taught me rightly dividing the word of God. So, um, you know, the old videos are taken down. I'm going to be putting out new content. Hopefully, uh, this will bless you guys. For anyone that's just looking to grow in the Word of God, uh, I've got a special guest tonight. He's going to really bless you guys. So, um, without further ado, this is Brother David Reed from Columbus Bible Church. Well, Chris, uh, thank you so much. It's really an honor to be with you and uh, look forward to our conversation together. Absolutely. So, what, what I did was I actually sent out a request for anyone that wants to learn about right division, they want to learn about rightly dividing the word of God, uh, to just ask some questions so we can kind of address them all little by little. And for anyone that's new to rightly dividing, we're going to start at the ground. We're going to start at the basics, hopefully, uh, so we can all grow together and learn exactly what it means to rightly divide the word of God. So uh, let's dive right into it. The first question, I think it's a great one to start with. What does it mean to rightly divide the word of God? Uh, I think a lot of people who hear the word right dividing, they immediately assume that uh, you're supposed to ignore the Old Testament and just focus on Paul's teaching, but that, that couldn't be further from the truth. So, uh, Brother Dave, if you could just, what does it mean to rightly divide the word of God? So that's, that's a great question, and it's a question that people have pondered and struggled with for a, a long, long time. So the verse that we're talking about is 2 Timothy 2.15, and it starts with the word study. Uh, in fact, 2 Timothy 2.15 is the only verse in Scripture that explicitly tells us to study the Word of God. And what it says is, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it commands us to study the Bible, of course, but then it tells us 
how to study it. We are to rightly divide the word of truth. Now, if you just think through that for a minute, what that tells you then is the Bible must have divisions in it. If God commands us to rightly divide the word of truth, then there must be divisions. Since it commands us to rightly divide, that means it's possible to wrongly divide. So just from that verse, we see a couple things. We see that the Bible has divisions, and we see that we have to be careful to rightly divide it. And and what happens is, I'll just put it this way, 100% of the Bible is true. Every single verse, every single word, every single line, it's all true. But it is not all written to us today. So, for example, the Bible commanded Noah to build an ark. We know that's true. But I've never met a Christian today that actually is building an ark because they're scared of a worldwide flood. Leviticus commands the offering of animal sacrifices. I've never met a Christian today that thinks they should offer animal sacrifices. It's because we all realize those things are true, but they're not written for us today. So the key uh, in rightly dividing the, the word of truth is to simply understand what the Bible says about what's written for us today. Does that mean that the words of Jesus Christ in the four Gospels, were they written directly to us? You know, when we read the four Gospels, a lot of people, they see the red letters. They think as soon as these words are the most important to me. Um, So what does that mean with rightly dividing that when we see the four Gospels, was the words of Jesus Christ directly written to us today uh, as members of the body of Christ? Yeah, that's a great question. And and let's, let's start by just talking about red letter Bibles for a minute. So red letter Bibles are very popular, and of course, we all know that when God originally dictated his word to mankind, there weren't red letters in the manuscripts that Paul wrote and James and John and so on. Um, Because of red letter Bibles, people tend to prioritize the words of Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry more than anything else. Uh, But if you think about what Scripture says, like Luke 4, 4, for example, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so my encouragement to your listeners, Chris, would just be this. We have to value every word that God spoke, not just the red letters, but all of them. So when we start to look at, at what the Lord Jesus Christ spoke during his earthly ministry, there's, a, there's some fascinating things. Like, for example, in uh, Matthew one twenty one, it says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he came to save his people from their sins. He was clearly sent to the nation of Israel. In Matthew 10, verses 5 and 6, when the Lord sent out the twelve, he he told them, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Give you another verse, Matthew 15, 24, the Lord said, I am not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so what happens is, as you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's very clear time and time again that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent to the nation of Israel, and he was not sent to Gentiles. The 12 apostles were sent to Israel and were not sent to Gentiles. Now, most of your audience, most of the people on the earth today, in fact, the vast majority, are Gentiles. And we live during the dispensation of grace. And and we have an apostle today, his name is Paul, Romans 11.13 describes him as the apostle of the Gentiles. Paul's ministry was obviously different from the the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. So to, to get back to your specific question, are the words of Jesus Christ in the four Gospels written directly to us? No, they're not written directly to us. We can learn from them. They're certainly true, but they're not addressed to us today, just like Some of the things in the Old Testament are not uh, addressed to us today. It was simply written to a different audience. Got you. I actually, starting my walk with Rightly Dividing, I actually picked up a book, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's uh, Jesus Was Not Talking to You by uh, Terrence McLean. Uh, It kind of is what started my whole looking into Rightly Dividing, and uh, it's not something that someone it's easy to accept when, when you, you grow up one way and you believe that the words of, of Jesus Christ, obviously in red letters are so more important than anything you read for someone to, to come to uh, understanding that who he was speaking to and that we've been wrong all these years that he wasn't speaking to the body of Christ today. Um, it's not something that's easy to 
understand. It's not something for a lot of people to accept, but uh, the more you dive into scripture and you really read what Christ was saying, he really was sent to the lost sheep of Israel. He wasn't speaking to the body of Christ yet, Um, which brings us to the third question, which is, what is the revelation of the mystery of Christ? Um, So if you want to just touch on that, you know, in contrast to we know Christ's words were to the lost sheep of Israel. So what exactly was, was Paul speaking to when he spoke on the revelation of the mystery of Christ? That's a great question. And the way we should start to think about that is we should first define what a mystery is in the scriptures. So if you, if you turn to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7, what, what Paul says is, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. And then he says, even the hidden wisdom. Now, one of the things that Scripture does is sometimes it will give words specific meanings. And in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, it tells us what the meaning of the word mystery is for scriptural purposes. It's wisdom that is hidden. And so what a mystery is, is it's, it's God's wisdom that is hidden for a period of time until God chooses to reveal it. Now, you asked the question about the mystery of Christ, and and so in order to understand that, we need to go to the book of Ephesians. And uh, what, what Ephesians 2 verse 11 says, it talks about time past. So we all know that the basic division of time is past, present, and future. Everyone knows that. Scripture in Ephesians 2 talks about time past, but now ages to come. In other words, past, present, future. It just uses the the terminology. Time past, but now, ages to come. So we live during but now. But let's just make sure we understand time past, because if we understand what time past was like, it'll help us understand but now. So Ephesians 2 verse 11 says this, Wherefore remember that ye being in in time past, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So it's obviously it's talking about Gentiles. Now, verse 12 says this, that at that time, that's time past, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So what's that mean? We all know that in time past, Israel was God's chosen people. Gentiles were not. What Ephesians 2, 11 and 12 tells us very specifically is Gentiles at that time, they're aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, they're strangers from the covenants of promise, they're without Christ, they're without hope in the world. It's hard to overstate how bad that was. It was just really bad for Gentiles. But we live during a time today that's different. And so if, if you could think about Ephesians 3 with me, I want to just cover some verses in Ephesians 3 because it's going to tell us how, but now, how the time period in which we live today, the dispensation of grace, is different from time past. So Ephesians 3 verse 1 says this, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now we know that's very different from what the Lord said in in Matthew 15, 24. Then verse 2 says this, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Verse 2 specifically says that the dispensation of the grace of God is given me. It was given to Paul. Now, what some people will say is they'll say dispensationalism never existed. It was just invented in the 1800s, and it didn't exist before that. Well, the word dispensation has been in the King James Bible since 1611, and obviously the word was in Greek since the first century when the Holy Spirit dictated it. So when people say dispensationalism is recently invented, it's, it's, it's just not so. So Ephesians 3.3, 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Now let me just pause here for a minute. Paul says he learned the mystery by revelation. If you think about what Paul was doing before he got saved, he was on the road to Damascus. He was persecuting the kingdom church, and he was persecuting the kingdom church because of their doctrine. That is the very reason he was doing it. And if that's what he was doing, he knew Peter's doctrine. Paul did not need Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus to appear to him and say, have you heard what Peter's preaching? Paul absolutely knew. What Paul needed is he needed revelation to learn the mystery 
because the mystery was completely different from what Peter was preaching. Now, if we look at Ephesians 3, 5, it's going to say, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. In other words, the dispensation of grace in verse 2, which is called the mystery in verse 3, in other ages it was not made known. So Isaiah didn't know it, Jeremiah didn't know it, John the Baptist didn't know it, Peter didn't know it, and they didn't know it for the simple reason that a mystery is hidden wisdom. And it's hidden until God himself decides to reveal it, and he didn't decide to reveal it until he revealed it to the Apostle Paul. Now, Ephesians 3, verse 6 is going to give us the specific definition of this mystery. Here's what it says. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. Now, you recall just a few moments ago in Ephesians 2, it told us that the Gentiles were without hope. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of the promise. It didn't say they were fellow heirs. It said they were without hope. But today, in the dispensation of grace, but now, things are different. Gentiles are fellow heirs with Israel, which they were not in time past. And then I'll just read verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, notice this next phrase, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. What, what most of Christendom does is they say Peter and Paul preach the exact same thing. Paul comes along a little later because he's stubborn, but once he gets saved, he preaches the exact same thing as Peter. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Paul had a mystery, which from the beginning of the world was hitting God. And if it was hitting God, don't say that men figured it out. They didn't. They didn't know it until God chose to reveal it to Paul. So what is the revelation of the mystery of Christ? It's that today in the dispensation of grace is that Jews and Gentiles are fellow heirs in one body. That wasn't true in time past. We just covered that the words of, of Jesus Christ were to the lost sheep of Israel. And the gospel and the, and the doctrine that you and I have nowadays, it was a revelation that was given to Paul. The mystery of uh, the body of Christ and what we have in Christ is we live in Christ and he lives in us, if I'm correct, Dave. And we don't need to get these blessings from going through Israel. Is that correct? That we, we are blessed because we are in Christ and he is in us. Uh, that is what was completely different from time past, where if a Gentile wanted to be blessed, they had to go through Israel. Um, we don't need to go through Israel. We come through the blood of Christ and as through Christ, we are co-heirs with the, there is no Jew or Gentile. We are equal heirs uh, with Christ. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that, that's well put. I mean, if you think about time past, the, the, the Gentiles were without hope. It, it, it's fascinating when you just think about David when he's fighting Goliath. What, what David says is, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Well, is David just using nasty language? Well, he was making the point that the, that Goliath was an uncircumcised Gentile. And as an uncircumcised Gentile, he was an alien from the Commonwealth of Israel. He didn't participate in the blessings. That just, you know, he was just without hope in the world. Now, of course, a Gentile in time past could convert and become part of the nation of Israel, but unless they did that, they're without hope. And what you just said is right. Today, do Gentiles have direct access to God? Yes, we do. Hallelujah. Uh, it's very different from what it was. Amen. So moving along, th then the next question that I'm sure people are asking is, if we're getting our doctrine from, from the, the revelation that was given to Paul, apart from Christ, can we find anything in the Old Testament that is going to bear witness to what Paul has been given? Are we found anywhere when we look in the, in the Psalms or we look at, in you know, all these books we all need uh, for our daily lives, but as far as doctrine for today, as members of the body of Christ, are we going to go and, and find anything in the Old Testament that's going to be directly to us as members of the body of Christ? Yeah, the, the body of Christ is not mentioned anywhere between Genesis to Malachi. It's not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, in fact, it's not mentioned in Scripture until Romans 7. The, the first time you see the phrase, the body of Christ, referring to the, the church of today, is in Romans chapter 7, and for the simple reason that it was just a mystery that, that God had hidden until he revealed it to Paul. Now, to, just to be super clear, 
we can learn things from the Old Testament, and, and we should read it, and we should study it. All of that is true. But if, if, if we're thinking about the, the question of what commands did God specifically give us today that he wants us to obey, that information is contained in Paul's epistles, Roman to Philemon. Just to kind of to build on that, uh, I just wanted to, to show some comparisons. Acts 3.21, it says, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Okay, so this is something that was spoken of by the prophets that was prior to Paul getting the revelation of the mystery. Uh, and then you see in contrast, Romans 16, 25, it says, Now to him that is, the, that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So we have something that was that was spoken by the prophet since the world began and something that was kept secret. So we see a complete contrast there in indifference, um, as well as in John 5, 39, it says, search the scriptures for in them, ye think that you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. This, this was something that Christ was spoken of in the scriptures that testified of him in comparison to Ephesians 3, 8, it says, uh, Paul was saying unto me who am less than the least of all saints is the grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So these are what we have today in the body of Christ are not anything that we can find in the Old Testament. These riches that we have, the blessings that we have in Christ today are unsearchable. We cannot find them in the Old Testament. So we have you know, the, the one that the in the Old Testament that testified of Christ and they were very much searchable to find Jesus Christ and him dying on a cross. It was all in the Old Testament. But what we have today as a member of the body of Christ, as a Gentile, a fellow heir, the unsearchable riches, meaning you cannot find what we have in Christ today in the Old Testament. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And that's well said. I mean, one of the things that happens is sometimes we're taught to explain away what scripture says, right? But there's a difference between things that are spoken of since the foundation of the world and things that are hidden, and they're just not the same. Yep, moving on. Uh, the next question that was sent in, did the body of Christ begin at the cross, Dave? That's, that's, uh, that's a big one. That's because a lot of people, they you know grow up in the churches and you automatically think, you know, because when we open up our Bible, it says Old Testament and New Testament beginning at Matthew. And then we automatically think that uh, the body of Christ starts the day Christ died. But is that truly when the body of Christ began? Uh, no, it, it didn't begin then. Uh, the, the body of Christ was first revealed to the Apostle Paul. And of course, at the cross, the Apostle Paul is not even a believer. Uh, you know, it, when we, we first see him in, in the book of Acts, he's persecuting the church. So the body of Christ does not begin at the cross. It begins after the cross when that information is revealed to the Apostle Paul in the middle of the book of Acts. So then I, the next question obviously would be, well, did the body of Christ begin at Pentecost? Because that's another one where, you know, when we read Pentecost, we automatically think that that group, um, the little flock of believers, that that was they were getting saved the same way you and I were, which is, is just not, it's not true. It's not when the body of Christ started. So if you could just touch on what exactly took place at Pentecost, if it wasn't the, the start of the body of Christ. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question, because uh, if you took a survey of, of folks within Christendom, a, a very high percentage would say that the church of today started in Acts chapter two. And you'll hear people say, we need to get back to Pentecost. Yeah. Uh, meaning we need to get back to how things were in Acts chapter 2. But if we just spend a little bit of time looking at Acts chapter 2, it's going to be very clear that Acts chapter 2 is not the beginning of the church, of the body of Christ for today. It's not that. It is the continuation of the kingdom church that John the Baptist started in the gospel. So let me give you a couple of verses just to prove that point. So if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, well, Pentecost is the, is the Jewish feast of weeks. It's a Levitical feast that's mentioned in the Old Testament. So what we're seeing in Acts 2 is it's a, a Jewish feast. Acts 2, verse 5 then says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews 
devout men out of every nation under heaven. So verse 1 told us it was a Jewish feast day. Verse 5 tells us we're in Jerusalem, and it tells us the people that are present are Jews. Acts chapter 2 verse 10 describes the people there as Jews and proselytes. In other words, it's Jews and it's Gentile converts to Judaism. Then if you read Acts chapter 2.16, it says this, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now just pause there and think about that. A lot of people want to say Acts 2 is the beginning of something new. It's really the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. In other words, Peter stands up, and, and, and by the authority of the Holy Spirit, he says, this is what was spoken about in the book of Joel. If you look at Acts chapter, 20, uh, chapter 2, verse 22, ye men of Israel, again, this, this whole section of, uh, of Scripture in Acts chapter 2 is addressed to the nation of Israel. And then if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41, at the conclusion of Peter's preaching, here's what it says. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. The added is important because what's happening is it's an addition to the church that was already in place. So in other words, when you think of the ministry of John the Baptist, when you think of the 12 apostles during the Lord's earthly ministry, they were adding people to what Luke 12, 32 calls the little flock. They were adding people to that kingdom church. What happens in Acts 2 is it is an addition of 3,000 people to that same church. It's not the start of a new church. And uh, if we could, let's spend a little time together in Luke 13, because I just think this this passage is, might be helpful as we think about things. So Luke 13, verse 6, and this is the, the well-known parable of the fig tree. Luke 13, verse 6, he spake all this, also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and he sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years... I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Verse 8. And he answering and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Now what does that parable mean? Well, here's what it means. He comes to the fig tree and he finds it doesn't bear fruit. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does when he comes to Israel. He comes to Israel, and he doesn't find Israel in belief. He finds them in unbelief. He finds them not bearing fruit. Well, how many years does he spend with them? He spends three years with them. That's his earthly ministry. And the suggestion is made, cut down the tree. And what the, the Lord says here is, no, I'm not going to cut it down. I'm going to give it one more year. So if you add that up, it's, it's obvious what's happening. The first three years are the three years of the Lord's earthly ministry, and then the additional year is the one year in the book of Acts, between Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 7, which is a continuation of the very same kingdom ministry that took place before the cross. It's the same ministry. In other words, the early part of the book of Acts is not the start of the body of Christ. It's the continuation of the same kingdom ministry that was in effect prior to the cross. Yeah. So to kind of slow things down for anyone that, because that, that parable really is what got me on, on, on board with studying more and learning right division. What he's saying is that when, when Christ came to the earth and, and they were printing, repent and be baptized. And he was preaching the coming kingdom. Christ's earthly ministry, he was coming to fulfill the promises of the forefathers to bring about a physical kingdom on earth. Um, after he died, when Peter was, uh, I'm sorry, when Stephen was stoned, when he looked up after he, right before he died and gave up the, the spirit, when, when Stephen looked up, Jesus Christ was standing up. So, at that point, had Israel repented of their, obviously killing their Messiah, repented of their sins, and started following Christ's teaching, at that point, the tribulation would have started, am I, am I right, Dave, where 
there would have been a seven year period where Christ was standing up where he was ready to, uh, I guess, allow this, the, the tribulation period to begin. And then it would have been his second coming for a physical kingdom on earth. Or am I off there? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, the way I would put it, you're, I'd say something very similar to that. Yeah. So in Acts chapter two, when Peter speaks by the power of the Holy Spirit, he says, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. So two things we need to notice there. He says, sit. So the Lord Jesus Christ was going to sit. But then it says, until I make thy foes thy footstool. So in Acts 2, because the Lord had ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1, what he was doing is he was sitting at the Father's right hand. But he wasn't going to sit at the Father's right hand forever. He was going to sit until he makes his foes his footstool. So when we fast forward in time to Acts chapter 7, and it's, it's fascinating because when you read Acts 7 verses 55 and 56, it says this in, in each verse. In other words, it says it twice. Stephen looks into heaven and he sees the Lord standing. In other words, what happened between Acts 2 and Acts 7 is the prophetic clock ticked forward. And the Lord Jesus Christ was standing because he was about to make his foes his footstool. Now, if God had not interrupted the prophetic program, if he hadn't interrupted it with the body of Christ, with the dispensation of grace, what would have happened is those prophetic events would have continued to tick onward, and eventually the 70th week would have happened, and everything that had been prophesied would have taken place at that time. But, but praise God, God did something that really benefited you and me. He basically called a timeout. He said, I'm going to put the prophetic program on hold. It's not that I'm going to choose not to fulfill these prophecies. I'm going to choose just to delay them. I'm going to fulfill them in, in the future at a time of my choosing, because right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this unprophesied time of Gentile grace where Gentiles can now be fellow heirs. And so what he did is he put the prophetic program on hold, and today you and I can be saved by the gospel of Christ, which wasn't revealed before. Amen. And, and that really is something that people need to get when rightly dividing, that you know, the, the, the prophetic program for Israel is not done away with. The Lord did not... Uh, you know, just do away with Israel. Now he's focused on us today. And that's going to get into our next question. But uh, everything that the Lord promised to Israel is still coming to them. Okay, so what we're in right now, the dispensation of grace is not, uh, it's not doing away with Israel in any way. So leading into that, let's also get into the next question is, is the body of Christ spiritual Israel? Um, this is a big topic, because you can see in, in just in the, in the online community, just around the world, there's the Hebrew Roots Movement, the Torah Observant Movement, that they're, they're placing themselves as being Israel. Um, so if you could just touch on that, is the body of Christ Israel in any capacity? Did we take away from anything, any promises of theirs? Are we spiritual Israel, as some like to claim? Um, and if you could just elaborate on that, what exactly, what that means as far as who we are then? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, people say that all the time, that the body of Christ is spiritual Israel. And, you, you know, the short answer is that's just not true. Uh, the body of Christ is not spiritual Israel. There is no verse that says that. And, you know, frankly, just th think through this with me for a moment. When God made promises to Abraham and to Jacob and the, the multiple promises he made in the Old Testament, was God a liar or was he not? And, and we both know the answer is no, he's not a liar. So when he made those promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and so on, he is absolutely going to fill those promises to the people he promised it to. Okay, he absolutely has to do that because he is a God of truth and he is a God of his word. And so let me you know, in, introduce the, the subject this way, this might help. I think it's, it's very helpful to just think about Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So when God, you know, he chose the first sentence of the Bible very carefully, and he could have said God made 
you know, the heaven and he made the planets and he made the animals and he, he could have worded it any way he wanted, but he worded it in a very specific way. He said, God made the heaven and the earth. And what I would suggest to you is that all of human history, the entire timeline of history is about a warfare that plays out between God and Satan over who's going to control heaven and earth. Now, the reason why that matters is this, is if you think through it, it's very clear that Israel is God's people that are going to dwell on the earth forever. So if you, if you look at Genesis 13, verse 15, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. That's what God said to Abram in Genesis 13. In Genesis 17, verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. So think about this with me just for a minute. If God says to Abram, I'm going to give you this land to you and to your seed forever, and he tells them it's going to be an everlasting possession, can he just decide 2,000 years later, you know, psych, didn't really mean it, I'm giving it to these Gentiles? Well, that, that is just not possible. God is a God of truth, and he did not do that. He would not do that. So Israel is God's people that are going to dwell on the earth forever. But let's talk about what we are today. We're the body of Christ. So today, when someone believes the gospel, they're spiritually baptized into the body of Christ. Where are we going to be? And where we're going to be is not on this earth. So if we look at Ephesians 1 verse 3, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So you and I, we're going to spend eternity in heavenly places. We're not going to be on the earth forever. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 says this, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So where we're going to be for eternity, where the body of Christ is for eternity, is the heavens. If we had taken the place of Israel, if we were spiritual Israel, Israel, if we um, were to take the place of Israel, we would have to be on the earth forever. We're not. We're in the heavens forever. So when people say the body of Christ is spiritual Israel, it's, it's, it's just not. For that to be the case, God would have to break his promises to Israel, and he just will not do that. Amen. And, you know, it's, it's sad to see so many people walk away from grace because they're, this is why rightly dividing is so important, I, I believe, because it, it clears up any of the, uh, the contradictions or, or anyone just that, that doesn't understand what they're reading in the word of God. It makes the word of God so easier to understand when you know who's it written to for the context of what you're reading, who's it written to. And we have a, a, a definitive answer now as far as who we are in the body of Christ today and where we get our uh, instructions today, which is the next question. We know the Old Testament doesn't have the, the revelation of the mystery of Christ, which was revealed to Paul. We know that the four gospels, Christ came to the lost sheep of Israel to fulfill the promises of the forefathers. Uh, uh, minister of the circumcision. We know that Paul was revealed the revelation in mid-Acts. So leading up to mid-Acts, we're still seeing the little flock and preaching the kingdom gospel. So what books in the word of God today do we look to for instructions for us today as members of the body of Christ? It's a terrific question. And uh, we know from Romans eleven thirteen 13, that, that Paul is our apostle. What it says is, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. So Paul is clearly the apostle of the Gentiles, and he's our apostle for today. And the, the, the books that he wrote all, of course, have his name as the first word of those books. So the books Romans through Philemon, those 13 books are specifically written for the body of Christ today. They are the specific instructions given to us. And I'll, I'll, I'll just let me just emphasize this because, you know, the truth of the matter is, you know, sometimes people say things about dispensationalism that are not true. And they'll say dispensationalists ignore the rest of the Bible or they chop up the Bible or they ignore everything other than Paul. Well, 
we believe the whole Bible. We think people should read the whole Bible. We think they should study the whole Bible. We think they should read Genesis. We just don't think they should build an ark. We think they should read Leviticus. We just don't think they should offer an animal sacrifice. We think they should read Matthew, but we don't think they should convert and become members of the nation of Israel. So the, the question is not whether the, the whole word of God is true. It is. The question is whether all of it should be applied today, and, and, and obviously it, it shouldn't be. Yeah. So as people are hearing this, I can, I can feel their blood boiling already saying, you guys are, <laughs> you're only following Paul. When you look in Romans through Philemon, the words that are in there are not Paul's. They're, they are Paul's, but it's coming from our Lord Jesus Christ. These, are, these were Holy Spirit-inspired words. These are instructions from Christ that he gave to Paul to give to us. So when you read those words, it's not, you're not putting Paul on a higher plateau than Christ. You're just understanding what Christ wants you to do today and his instructions for you as a member of the body of Christ today. Um, so with that said, when we, when we were saying Romans through Philemon are our instructions today as members of the body of Christ, what does that mean? Dave, in your opinion, when we read Hebrews through Revelation. So for years, we have debates and people have, they spent their lives trying to study Revelation, trying to put themselves in there. Are we found in Hebrews through Revelation at all? And when you get the, the answer, I'll let you answer this, but it, this really clears up a lot when you realize that, you know, we are, our instructions today are in Romans through Philemon, and that is it. Well, that's exactly right. And if you think about Paul's division of the scriptures into time past, but now, ages to come, well, there's, there are ages to come, and there needs to be part of scripture that's written for people in ages to come. Um, so Hebrews to Revelation is written for people in the future in ages to come. It's not written for us. Um, I don't know, if you, perhaps your audience is too spiritual and they won't get this reference, but... Uh, Carly Simon said, you're so vain, you probably think this song is about you. And what happens is <laughs> sometimes people think every verse somehow has to be about them, and it's, it's just not. God has multiple purposes he's accomplishing throughout time, and not every verse is about us. And if I could just for a moment go back to something you said, you were making a great point. Um, some people are going to say that we're worshiping Paul, and and I'll just, uh, let me put it this way. What, what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, 37, is he said, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So in other words, if you're spiritual today, you have to recognize that what Paul wrote are the commandments of the Lord. We don't worship Paul because we care about his opinions. We're not interested in his personal preferences. The fact of the matter is what the Lord Jesus Christ did is he appeared to Paul out of heaven and he gave him specific revelation that he expects us to obey. And if I could just use this, this example, if you were alive uh, in the book of Exodus and you were to say, well, you make too much of Moses. I'm not going to listen to this Moses guy. I'm going to follow God. Well, the fact of the matter is Moses was God's chosen vessel. And when you disobeyed Moses, you were disobeying God because that was who God, God chose. So whether you liked it or not, Moses was the revealer of the Old Testament law. Well, the same thing is true for us today. God chose Paul. And if we're going to do what God would have us to do, we need to recognize God's spokesman. And that's yeah. Paul. Yeah. And uh, I know for me now going back and reading Hebrews, first and second Peter, first and second, third John, Revelation, reading these books in the mind state that when I'm reading them, it's not written directly to me as a member of the body of Christ. Cause there is, when you read them, there is very, there's mentions of, uh, uh, becoming or the a royal priesthood and enduring to the end and there's there's words in there and there's verbiage in there that is uh, like James for instance he says uh, you know can faith alone save a man and we know clearly Paul says we are saved by grace through faith we see these contradictions and we at least me for years what I would try to do is I would try to bend scripture around I would forget other scripture that is what rightly dividing does. It clears up any kind of contradiction. We know the word of God doesn't contradict itself. What we were doing wrong all these years was we were taking the whole pot and trying to make it all for us rather than 
what Christ said, he meant. We don't have to spiritualize what Jesus said. He meant it, but he didn't mean it to you. What James said when he said faith alone is not going to save a man is true. When the dispensation of grace is over, you know, just saying that, you know, you, you believe, but, you, you know, what you're doing on earth, uh, you know, is not reflect or it's not showing that faith. Uh, obviously, the, those words are exactly what they mean. Am I right, Dave? Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. And just to build on your point there, if I could, when you read Hebrews to Revelation, you're going to read First John, and there's an unforgivable sin. When you read the book of Revelation, there's something called the mark of the beast. Now, the fact of the matter is the mark of the beast doesn't exist today during the dispensation of grace. Today, during the dispensation of grace, there isn't an unforgivable sin. The only thing that's unforgivable is if you die without faith in Christ, you're going to go to hell. But when you read Hebrews to Revelation, and you understand these books are written for a future time period, and there'll be a time in the future where there is the mark of the beast being administered, and there will be unforgivable sins. And if you just let those books apply for the people that they're intended to, you don't have any of these problems. But if you take those verses, those books, and you say, well, I have to somehow manipulate this so it applies to me, you're just going to create problems for yourself because those books aren't addressed to us. The next question that was presented was, wasn't it, or isn't there only one gospel in the Word of God? Uh, you know, I'm sure right now a lot of people spent the majority of their walk with the Lord preaching and witnessing to others John three sixteen and thinking that that is the the go to gospel that we should be preaching to people and that it's the same gospel as First Corinthians. Corinthians one through four, but is there only one gospel? And I, I'm I'm sure you, you know you can elaborate on this greatly to help someone to show uh, that there was obviously more than just one gospel or good news. Yeah, great, great question. Um, l- l- let me be be really specific about this. You can only get saved through Jesus Christ, right? We know from John fourteen six. We all know this verse. No man cometh to the Father but by me, because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And I paraphrase there, but you you, you understand the point. Um, But the fact of the matter is, Scripture says there's more than one gospel. The word gospel means good news. There is more than one item of good news in the Scripture. God can do what he wants. He's not limited where there's a quota, and he's only allowed to have one piece of good news. He can have more than one, and in fact, Scripture says he has more than one. So as an example, let me read to you Galatians 2, verse 7, and I'll just read it exactly as it, as, 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 as it is written. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that's Paul, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Now, we know that Peter and Paul had different messages. We looked at that earlier. But what I would just note here is, if Scripture is right, and it is, Paul had something called the gospel of the uncircumcision. Peter had the gospel of the circumcision. And just to state the obvious, uncircumcision and circumcision are different. The word un means not. We all know this. Something that is unusual is not usual. So if Paul has the gospel of the uncircumcision and Peter has the gospel of the circumcision, they are different gospels. Now, just so we're clear, that doesn't mean that there's different ways of salvation. Someone's going to misinterpret this and they're going to say, well, you can be saved any old way you want and you can be saved by other religions. And No, no, we're not saying that at all. But what we're saying is, Did God at different times give different gospels to mankind? He sure did. Um, You know, if you think about this, for example, did God say to Noah, Noah, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? That's not what he said. He said, no, I'm going to flood the earth. You better build an ark. And if what Noah had done, if Noah had said, God, I'm not going to build an ark because I'm just going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he would have drowned. Because the gospel to him, the message to him, required him to build an ark. And there are just different gospels in the Bible. That that runs contrary to some people's feelings about how it should work. But but what I would just encourage your, your listeners about is this. We should believe what God's word says rather than our own presuppositions, right? If God's word says that Peter and Paul had different gospels, 
they did. We may not like it. We may think it should have been otherwise, but that's the way it is. Amen. And, and just so we can make it clear, it has always been by God's grace someone is saved. That, that is nothing new. That is not a, the mystery that was given to Paul. And it's always been necessity to have faith. It's always been faith and, and God's undeserving grace to us that we receive in grace. So that is nothing new that Paul received. The difference is in the dispensation of grace, we are saved apart from works, apart from Israel. We are justified today when we recognize our sinful state and we we put our trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried in the tomb and rose again on the third day. At that point, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until redemption, seated with Christ in heavenly places, given peace with God by believing the gospel, believing this good news. Now. What Christ was preaching, if if I am not right here with this day, please stop me. But the the Old Testament saints and, and the 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 kingdom gospel that Christ was preaching was the they had to follow Christ's instructions, believing that He was the Messiah. Um, it included water baptism. We can get into that later. Water baptism. Um, repenting of their sins. These things did not save them, but they were proof of their faith that they believed who Jesus was, who he said he was. So it's always been God's grace. It's always been about faith. But in the dispensation of grace we live in, we understand that we're justified by not works, nothing, not law keeping. We are not justified by being a good person doing anything, but trusting in the gospel. And God doesn't look at us for our works to justify us like in time past where that was a requirement, not to save you, but it was to demonstrate your, your true faith. Um, is that right, Dave? Yeah, no, that, that's well said. What it, what it reminds me of is this. Romans ten seventeen says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which means that all true faith is not based upon man's opinion. It's based upon the word of God. So I'll give you an example. I don't know if any of you have had this experience. Some people will say, you know, some pastors or preachers will say, you know, we're going to start this new building program and we don't have the money for it, but we're going to just step out in faith and God's going to open the windows of heaven and pour out dollars and we're going to build this building. And what I would say to that, you can decide for yourself, but that's not faith. I mean, Proverbs has a lot to say about incurring debt, and buying things that you don't have the money for, right? It's not faith when you do something just of your own volition. It's faith when you do something on the basis of God's word. So for you and me today, what God said to us is he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So the heart of faith says, I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's not what Peter said in Acts 2.38, as you pointed out. He said, repent and be baptized. So what faith does is faith responds to the word of God that is addressed to us. Amen. And this this exact question is very important because Romans 2.16, it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So what Paul was given to us, the revelation of the mystery, the gospel that Paul presented us is... is it's so important that we get this, that we are justified today, not of your good deeds, not of your ability to keep law or do anything, but because you heard the gospel and you believed in it. So this is what rightly dividing does. It shows you what the gospel is today. Do you believe that Christ is sufficient, that he did all the work for you? Or are you looking back in other books in the Old Testament and sprinkling in, I need to do X, Y, and Z, because at that point you are not believing in the gospel that Paul is giving you. This is right. why it's so very, very important that we come to realizing the importance of rightly dividing and, and understanding what our gospel is today. It's all Christ. God is not looking or, or holding you accountable for your good deeds, or your works in order to justify you. It's trusting in, in what Christ did alone. Um, that's why, you know, rightly dividing is it, it, so extremely important. And it, for years, my channel, I, I prided myself. I, I always had the gospel right, Dave, and I always was one that... You know, I always maintain the gospel and anyone that's um, come on my channel, eternal security, I've always had that right. And one of the reasons I even search for right dividing is because I was on the front lines every day of defending the gospel, defending our eternal security. So I, it took me a lot of just just completely diving into scripture. And then when I came upon right division, it just, the light came on. Like, 
I've been explaining it wrong to people. I've been explaining our eternal security and I've been explaining the gospel, but disproving the scriptures they were giving me, I, I was coming about it all wrong and, and right division clears up all those uh, questions. So we now know the, the clear gospel is, is trusting it in the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. Um, so well, brother, it, it was, it was great that you're standing for the gospel like that, because honestly the gospel today is corrupted by so yeah. many. Amen. Because they keep adding works to it, and when you add works to it, it it it, it, it invalidates grace. Yeah. Moving on, where will we spend our eternity as members of the body of Christ? I like this question because it's one uh, where we, uh, me personally, I just grew up my whole life thinking that I'm coming back with Christ when He comes back. I'm going to walk through uh, the, the, the new gates of the new Jerusalem, and I'm going to rule and reign on earth. I'd look in the parables where Christ would say he'd make you leader over a certain amount of cities, and I'd work hard because I wanted to be over 10 cities. Oh, I don't know about you, but I want... <laughs> Are we going to rule and reign on earth as part of the priesthood? Are we going to be here with, in the new Jerusalem? Are we walking through one of those 12 gates, Dave? Or, or we have other plans for as a member of the body of Christ? That's a great question. Uh, people ask that. They wonder about that all the time. Um, I'll give you a, a couple of verses that I think are relevant. So Ephesians 1, 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Uh, it's fascinating that in 1 Thessalonians 4, we are caught up. We're not caught sideways. We're caught up because we're going to heaven. Uh, if you think about Philippians 3, verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. And if you think about uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, and, and this one is, I think, the most convincing one. For, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands. And then here's the key part, eternal in the heavens. Well, eternal is pretty long, right? So we are in the heavens. Um, I think sometimes what happens is people, uh, you know, have an emotional attachment in terms of, well, I want to be on earth because I want to be in the new Jerusalem and I want to eat from the tree of life. And, you know, we have these sort of sensational ideas about what we want to do. And, and I guess what I would just say about that is uh, every blessing God has is wonderful, right? And uh, what he has planned for us in the heaven is spectacular and uh you know that's where we're going to be so it's, it's going to be tremendous it's in fact it's going to be out of this world amen moving on so the next question is the did the new covenant start yet are we living under the new covenant right now um when we read you know christ breaking the water or breaking the bread and, and the wine and, and uh people celebrate it at church every sunday you know the blood of the new covenant are we living under the new covenant right now, or is that something that uh, also we had wrong for all these years? Yeah, um, it's something we had wrong, and you know, frankly, I had it wrong too. And just yep. stating the, I should say this just before we go any further. On all these things, you know, what happens is none of us has it perfect, and we've all been through. You know, we've all been confused at times. So, as you and I, I, I know we were like-minded on this. We're just both trying to figure things out, right? So none of us yeah. have all the answers. But um, as to the new covenant, the new covenant has not already started. And, and we can tell that from Hebrews chapter 8. So Hebrews 8, verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, if we let God's word say what it says, that verse says the new covenant is made with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, the vast majority of people on the earth today are Gentiles. And if that verse means what it says, which it does, the new covenant doesn't have anything for Gentiles. It's not, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing where um, if your neighbor wins the lottery, you don't get any money, right? I mean, that's just how it is. I mean, welcome to, to, to life. Well, God made the new covenant with Israel. He made it with Judah. And that means it, it doesn't provide blessings. For the for Gentiles. Now, Hebrews 8 verse 9 says this, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. 
Well, that again, it, it, it just, it's absolutely clear from Hebrews that the new covenant is made with Israel. It's not made with the body of Christ and it's not made with Gentiles. Now consider verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. And what some people will say is, well, say, well, the new covenant, uh, that, that started when Israel was brought back into the land in 1948. The new covenant was put into effect. But listen to what Hebrews 8.10 says. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Now, the sad reality is that most of Israel is in unbelief, right? If Today, if Israel was in belief, what they should do is they should believe that Jesus Christ is the long-promised Messiah. They should have faith in the Son of God. You know, they, should, they should do all of those things that, that Scripture requires of us. So what happened in 1948 with Israel cannot have been the start of the new covenant because God obviously didn't write his law on their hearts. He didn't put it into their minds. They're, they're still there, unfortunately, in unbelief. So the new covenant is not in effect today. Yeah. The, the new covenant, if, I, if I'm right, Dave, is, is with the entirety of Israel. So when the, when the new covenant begins, it'll be when the entirety of Israel is, is at, at Christ's second coming. Everyone will have, you know, it, it's not just for certain uh, members of Israel, for certain people that are, uh, you know, the, the little flock or, or a couple here and there. It's for the entirety of Israel on that day where the new covenant will be for, for all of them. Um, and obviously, like you said earlier, we don't, we don't have that now. It's, it's not something that we have the death of the testator. Okay. So, so it's, it's ready to, to, to the new covenant is going to come when Christ comes, when he comes to earth. And, uh, you know, obviously Israel is going to have to go through the seven years of, uh, refining to get to there. But that this is what's been promised to them since the beginning, the, this new covenant that, you know, Christ is going to rule on earth physically with them as their king. They're going to be given the land that they were promised, not what they're in right now. Where the, you know, there's so much more land that the Lord promised to them. And the new covenant is, is for when the entirety of Israel, uh, they have their king. They have the spirit of God inside of them. So they don't, they don't have to fight to keep the laws. It is going to be something that they're going to have the spirit of God inside of them keeping it. Um, and we just don't have that right now. So all the, the, the churches on any given Sunday, you'll get up there, new covenant churches. We're just not in, it has not, first of all, it's, you never heard Paul mention that, that we are a part of the new covenant at all. You can go through any of Paul's epistles. He never mentions it. Um, so when we think of new covenant, we need to have the mindset that of what exactly the new covenant is and realize that it, it hasn't happened yet, but it will when Christ returns. That's right. Building on that, obviously, the next question would be, so do we have uh, the law written on our hearts? Is that something that's because we received the Holy Spirit? Does that mean that we have the law written on our hearts? Um, if you want to elaborate on that, Dave, because I know that's something that a lot of people teach that we have today, the law written on our hearts the moment we trusted in the gospel. Yeah, the, the, people do say that. And um you know, the, the greatest proof that the law is not written on our hearts is look how we behave. Um, you know, Paul talks about in, in Romans 7, uh, that which I hate, that do I. The, 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 just the reality of, of it is, is that the law has not been written in our hearts. But let me give you a couple of verses about that. So Jeremiah 31, 33, but, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Now, the, the, just it, It's wrong to take blessings that are given to other people and claim them for yourself, right? So in other words, when you look at Jeremiah 31, and God made that promise, it's specifically a covenant that he made with the house of Israel. He didn't make it with Gentiles. And so is God's law written in our hearts today? No, it's not. That's a blessing that, that's promised to Israel. We see the same thing in Hebrews 8.10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. The simple fact of the matter is during the dispensation of grace, Gentiles don't have the, the law, the God's law written on their hearts. It's just, it's just not something that he's doing today. Amen. Is repenting of sin and confessing your sin necessary for salvation we get 
people every day when you when you tell them that you know repenting of sin is is a change of a heart uh and confessing sin that they get from first john 1 9 um obviously without rightly dividing you're going to hear that and you're going to apply it to the to the gospel as far as what we need to do to to not e- either get saved or maintain our salvation it turns into a daily ritual that we feel we need to uh continue to uphold and do every day in order to sustain salvation when you know rather than than confessing sin we 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 should be lifting up you know the sacrifice Christ did for us and who we are in Christ and realize that we are perfected in him. But I want to let you to answer that uh, is repenting and confessing sin necessary to not just obtain salvation, but to sustain it as well. Yeah, this is a great question because there's a lot of confusion about the word repentance. And just, I would say as a general matter, one of the things that happens is people often take scriptural terms repentance is an example, and they will then attribute a non-scriptural meaning. And when they do that, they end up confusing the doctrine. What I, what I have found, uh, and, and I've, when I've studied this, you'll see a lot of gospel tracts, and people will use the word repent in a way that means quit sinning. So in other words, what you need to do to get saved is you need to repent, you need to stop sinning. But if you think about that for a minute, Salvation is not based upon works, right? So we all know Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So that tells you that you don't have to, you don't have to quit all your evil works to get saved. And by the way, you couldn't if you wanted to, right? Because we know that salvation is not of works. What I would tell you is important about this subject is to get the right understanding of what the word repent means. So if you look at Genesis 6, verse 6, it says this, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now, the the way that people typically define repent, repent means you got to quit sinning. Well, God repented in, in, in Genesis 6, 6. So did God have to quit sinning? In other words, when you take scriptures and you look at how scripture uses the word repent, you would not reach the conclusion that repentance means to quit sinning. That's not what repentance means. Repentance is a change of heart. God grieved in his heart because in Genesis 6, when he looked out at the earth, Genesis 6 says it was corrupt, it was filled with violence, and God was grieved by that. So let me put it this way. Repentance... The proper definition of repentance is that it's a change of heart. It is not you have to quit sinning. So what happens when you get saved today, let's just make this clear then, to get saved, you have to have a change of heart because you have to believe the gospel, right? I mean, the, the problem with most people is they don't believe the gospel. What, what, if, if you think of Acts 16, when Paul was in the jail in Philippi, the Philippian jailer comes into him and he asks the question that every man has to answer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That question is the dividing line for all eternity. And what Paul said to him is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So you get saved today by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, believing he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. So you have to have that change of heart in order to get saved. But you don't have to stop your sinning. You don't have to turn over a new leaf. You don't have to quit all your bad habits. That That's salvation by works, and salvation doesn't work that way. And we're, we're not encouraging anyone to continue in your sin. Walking by faith, it's the grace of God where we, we should be seeing changes in our lives and newness of life. And we're not, we're not telling anyone to be complacent with sin. What we're saying is it has nothing to do with your justification. Um, which a lot of people, because they don't rightly divide the word of God, have, like you said, Dave, they've corrupted the gospel. And it's now Christ has become an afterthought. And it's more so focused on, on what I can do and what I, how great I am. And look at all the changes I've done in my life. And yeah, Jesus did this, but look at how great I am. And none of us are good. If it isn't through the blood of Christ, none of us have any shot uh, of making it to, to stand before the Lord at the end of our lives. So uh, I just also wanted to put, you know, it, 
rightly dividing, if you can go back and look, there's nowhere in any of Paul's epistles does he say re- confess your sins, like, like 1 John 1, 9, where he says confess your sins. But we do see it in the Old Testament, Dave, in like Leviticus 26, 40, where he says, if they shall confess their iniquity, uh, you know, Psalm 32, 5, he says, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity I have I hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Second Chronicles 6.24 says, if, I, if thy people Israel to be put to the worst before the enemy because they have sinned against me shall return and confess my name. We, we see it throughout the Old Testament. It, it, was a, it was a requirement that they confess their sins. And, and when we read 1 John 1, 9, David, in the light of obviously what we see in the Old Testament, that is not saying today that we need to be confessing our sins. Every time we fall short, we need to ask God for forgiveness. We know that we're fully justified the moment we hear and believe in the gospel. But what did it mean for anyone that's listening to try and understand right division? What did it mean when First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us? What, what exactly is going on there? Because I know it's a question that people are going to want to know when, well, you know, trying to rightly divide the word of God, they're going to say, well, what about first John one nine? Don't we have to confess our sins? Uh, what would you say to that uh, in light of where we are today in the body of Christ? Yeah, great question. So first John one nine does talk about confession of sins. When we were talking earlier about Hebrews to revelation, we talked about how Hebrews to revelation is written for ages to come. It's, it's written actually, for the time after the body of Christ has already gone from the earth. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and we'll be with him for forever. Um, so 1 John 1, 9 is, is not written to us. Probably the easiest way to, to, to make the point, I would say, is this. If you think about the Old Testament, all the verses you just quoted, uh, you're, you're right about. In the Old Testament, they had to confess their sins again and again. There was a specific Old Testament sacrifice system so that when you trespassed, you would bring a trespass offering, and, and God expected them to do that, and they had to continue to do that. But there's a contrast. So if you think about Ephesians 4.32 and Colossians 2.13, they talk about God having forgiven us all trespasses. So in other words, here's what happens. The moment today you believe the gospel, God forgives you of all trespasses. Everything you did in the past everything you'll do in the future. So do you need to go then confess those to God to get forgiveness? You already have it. If you think about Romans 5 verse 1, it says, therefore, being justified. In other words, a a wonderful thing happened the moment you believed the gospel. The moment you believed the gospel, God forgave every sin you would ever commit He justified you, he declared you righteous, and you had peace with him from that very moment. And that is not what happened in the Old Testament. That's not how it operates under the prophetic program. When you think about verses like Matthew 24, 13, it talks about enduring unto the end. When you think about Ezekiel 18, it talks about the righteous man that turns from his righteous ways. See, the, what, what's, what's truly marvelous about the dispensation of grace is the moment you believe the gospel, God forgives your sins, seals you, you have eternal security, you can't lose it. It is just a miraculous, wonderful, you know, awesome arrangement. But the way it worked in the Old Testament and under the prophetic program was, you sinned, you had to go to confess. And then when you sinned again, you had to go confess. And that's just not, it did work that way then, but it's not that way for us. Amen. This is the next question. Isaiah 53, obviously it, it foretold, it prophesies of the death of Christ. So for anyone that's saying, you know, Paul's, rev, the revelation of the mystery that was given to Paul, how can anyone say that it was a mystery when Christ, obviously, in, in Isaiah 53, was told that he would die on the cross? It, it goes into detail of him dying, uh, being wounded for our transgression. So what exactly, uh, obviously, talking more, I think the mystery is the most important part of rightly dividing, understanding what exactly was revealed to Paul and what obviously was not the mystery, something that was told in the, in the Old Testament that we already, that, that we already had and, and that obviously was not nothing newly being revealed to Paul. So what exactly uh, is Isaiah 53 in regards to, was that part of the mystery that was revealed to Paul? So that's a great question. Because uh, sometimes what people will do 
is they'll, they'll say exactly what you said, which is, well, doesn't Isaiah 53 reveal everything that, that Paul preached? And the answer is that it doesn't. Um, so let's talk about it this way. Isaiah 53 reveals that, that, that the Messiah would die. And uh, that's the same thing, for example, as what the Lord said in John chapter 2, 19. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So it wasn't a mystery that Christ was going to die. It wasn't a mystery that he was going to die for Israel's sins. Matthew one twenty one says, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It wasn't a mystery that he would be resurrected. But what was a mystery was this. It was a mystery that when Christ died on the cross, he not only paid for Israel's sins, he also purchased the body of Christ. See, what happens today during the dispensation of grace, anyone who believes the gospel, they are placed into the body of Christ because Christ died for their sins. And that was a mystery. The body of Christ was not revealed in time past. It was not revealed that Jesus Christ was going to die for Gentiles. That was hidden until God revealed it through the Apostle Paul. Now, a point I should make that, that maybe will be helpful is if you think about Luke 18, I just want to read you a couple of verses from Luke 18. This is Luke 18, 31. Then he took unto him the twelve. This is the Lord with the twelve apostles shortly before the cross. It's, it's near the end of his earthly ministry. He says, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So what he's talking about is a fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 32, For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. Verse 33, And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. So did the Lord talk about the cross and the resurrection before it happened? Absolutely. The prophets talked about it. But notice what Luke 18.34 says, and they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. Now just pause for a minute and consider that. Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.18 calls his preaching the preaching of the cross. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says that his gospel is Christ died for our sins, was buried and resurrected. But in Luke 18, when the Lord tells the 12 apostles who've been traveling with him for years, guys, I'm going to go to the cross, I'm going to die, and I'm going to be resurrected, they don't understand what he's saying. Well, that tells you that Peter's gospel and Paul's gospel are not the same. So they're just... They're just different. So Isaiah 53 did prophesy the death of Christ, but it didn't prophesy the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Peter, as we see, he, he tried to stop Christ. He, he tried to, you know, he had no idea. Even all the way, if you read Acts 2, when, when they are repenting of it, they're looking at the cross as if it was a defeat, as if it was a bad thing. They were not glorifying in the sacrifice, in what Christ did on the cross. They were not preaching, the, obviously, the gospel of trusting in that as being what's going to save us. They were, you know, it, it was not preached in a way as if it was a good thing because they truly didn't understand what took place. So the next question, Dave, would be, okay, so where exactly are the Old Testament saints now? Somebody sent that question in. I think it's a great one because it, it does tie into where we're going to be. Uh, so where exactly are the Old Testament saints in, in regards to, you know, we're going to be in the heavens, that's where our eternal destination is. Well, where are the Old Testament saints now? Are they in heaven right now, uh, awaiting the rapture, or where are they right now? So if, if we look at, at Luke 16, Luke 16 gives the account of the rich man and Lazarus. People sometimes say that that's a parable, but it doesn't seem to be a parable. Every time uh, there's a parable, there's never someone that has a proper name like Lazarus. So so Luke 16 is not a parable, but here's what it says in verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And of course, we know what happens in Luke 16 is Lazarus ends up in a place in the earth called Abraham's bosom. The rich man ends up in hell, and there's a great gulf fixed between them. So in other words, in the Old Testament, before the cross, 
when when people that were believers died, they went to a place of blessing called Abraham's bosom. If you think about Luke 23, the Lord said to the thief on the cross, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So after the Lord died, he went into the heart of the earth. He went to the to, to paradise. He went to Abraham's bosom. It's very clear that's where the Old Testament saints were before the cross. Now, what some will say is they'll say, well, after the cross, all those saints that were in Abraham's bosom, they were caught up and they're now up in heaven. But look with me at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 34. And this is Peter speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. For David is not ascended into the heavens. I don't think that could be any more clear. David's an Old Testament saint. He would have been in Abraham's bosom. Acts 2 is after the cross. It's after the resurrection. It's after the ascension in Acts 1. It's well after the resurrection, in other words. And where's David? He's still in Abraham's bosom. And so let me tell you why I think that might be the case. If you think about the Old Testament saints, what is their future destiny? Are they going to spend their future destiny in the new heavens? No, their future destiny is the new earth. So what God does with them, he doesn't take them to the, the new, he doesn't take them to heaven after the cross. They remain in that place of blessing, that paradise in the earth, and they're waiting there until the Lord at the second coming resurrects them into his millennial kingdom. So today, right now, the Old Testament saints remain in paradise uh, inside the earth. Amen. So they're awaiting the the promises. They're awaiting the the new covenant where it, uh, the the valley of dry bones, where where the the dead are going to raise. They're going to inherit a physical kingdom. They're going to be living on earth with their Messiah. Uh, different than you and I today, where uh, the, as in the next question we're going to see, is the pre-tribulation rapture biblical? Uh, obviously, like you just talked about, the the Old Testament saints when the when the rapture of the body of Christ takes place, that is not their resurrection. They are not they're not going up to meet the Lord in the air to be with Him in heaven. They, they are waiting Christ's second coming. That's been prophesied all throughout the Old Testament, where they're going to inherit and raise up to inherit the earth for Israel. The promises that was to them, the mystery that Paul was given. This is another part of that mystery of of the pre tribulation rapture. A lot of people have lost their their hope in a pre tribulation rapture because they're they're looking in Matthew twenty four, they're looking in Revelation, they're in the Old Testament, they're comparing that with, with what we have in, in from Paul's doctrine. And it's difficult to see a pre tribulation rapture by not rightly dividing. Another great thing that rightly dividing clears up is the absolute uh definity that there is a pre tribulation rapture. We can see it through Paul's doctrine and what Paul was given to us. It was a mystery that you can't find in the Old Testament. So for all you preachers out there that are trying to preach doctrine on the rapture in the Old Testament, you're not, you're, you're putting your hands in something that doesn't belong to you. And it's not, you're not going to find the old, in the Old Testament, the pre-tribulation rapture. It was a, a mystery. As Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, behold, I show you a mystery. Meaning this is new revelation. This is something you're not going to find. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Um, Dave, the pre-tribulation rapture, can we, can we rest in knowing that one day this glorious day, that this blessed hope of ours is going to take place? Yeah, we, we absolutely can rest in that. And let me just give you a couple thoughts. So 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that we'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Um, so we know that we're caught up. What has happened today is some folks will, they, they've lost the timing of the rapture, right? So they want to put it in the tribulation or after the tribulation. Um, the, a couple verses that maybe will be helpful about that. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath. The moment we got saved, we were, we were placed into Jesus Christ, and God has no wrath for us. Well, after the, 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 after the catching up, after the rapture, or to put another way, during the 70th week, that's a time of God's wrath. So if God hasn't appointed us to wrath, how can we be on earth during the time of wrath? It doesn't make any sense. Another clue that we're not going to be here during Daniel's 70th week, 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about the rapture, behold, I show you a mystery. So it was a mystery that was revealed to Paul. Earlier, we established that the word mystery means hidden wisdom. So think about this with me, uh, if you would. In the Old Testament, the body of Christ is not revealed because it's a mystery. But if we're here during the 70th week and the rapture takes place during that time, wasn't it then revealed? I mean, that would be the, the point is it wasn't. And what God has done, I would suggest to you, is, is he's, he really has designed the timeline of history very nicely. Believers during the dispensation of grace have eternal security. During the 70th week, people have to endure unto the end. Is God going to take us and who, to whom he's given a promise of eternal security and say, oh, well, things have now changed. So you're now in the 70th week, and you have to endure unto the end. Well, God solves that problem because what he does is before there, there even is a 70th week, he takes the body of Christ to heaven because he delivers us from the wrath to come. So we can very clearly believe that there is a pre-tribulational rapture because that's how God operates because the body of Christ is not appointed to wrath. Amen, brother. Amen. Being as though we know now that there is a pre-tribulation rapture, we are separate from, obviously, the resurrection of Israel that takes place at Christ's second coming. Um, so when we are in heaven, we are going to be judging angels. Is, is, this is something that's biblical. Um, but what does it mean that we're going to be actually judging angels in heaven, that in our eternal destination in the heavens? We're going to actually be judging angels? Yeah, this is, this is something that's, that's in some ways hard to believe, but Scripture says it, so it must be true. Um, when Satan rebelled at the beginning of time, God could have destroyed him instantaneously. It would have been not hard at all for God to just speak him out of existence. But obviously, God allowed him to continue. And what I would suggest that God is doing during the, the dispensation of grace, we looked at the verses earlier that say that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places that we have in a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So what God is doing with the body of Christ is everyone who gets saved during the dispensation of grace is placed into the body of Christ. And at the catching up, we're going to be given a spiritual body that's designed to function in the heavens. And we will move up into the heavens. In Revelation 12, it's clear that there's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fight against the devil and his angels. And the devil and his angels lose, and they're cast down to the earth. And the devil and his angels ultimately will be cast into the lake of fire. So if you, if you think about that, what just happened? Well, there were a bunch of positions in heaven that to this day are still occupied by the devil and his angels. God hasn't gotten rid of them yet, but he will. And God, there's nowhere in Scripture that says God makes new angels. So it seems what happens is certain members of the body of Christ move into those positions formerly occupied by the devil and his angels. So when Paul says, know ye not that we shall judge angels, one of the blessings given to the body of Christ is that we have a, a leadership position over angels in the future, which is incredible, but Scripture says that that is, the, that is what's going to be the case. Amen. And I, I love the, like I, like I brought up earlier, that video you did on uh, leading captivity, cap, uh, a captive captivity. When Satan went inside of Judas, right, to kill our Messiah, he had no idea what Christ dying on the cross, he, he thought he was going to maintain his position in the, in the heavens at, with the angels. He thought allowing Christ to die on the cross he still had authority in the heavens, and he had no idea that by doing so, uh, he lost in both arenas on that day. And if you want to just elaborate, Job 15.15, 15, we see, like you mentioned before, it says, Behold, he, put, he putteth no trust in his saints, yet the heavens are not clean in his sight. So to this day, there are still the, the, the fallen angels that followed Lucifer that are still in the heavens that when the, the rapture of the body of Christ takes place, 
we are now taking over essentially essentially and had satan known this he would have never gone into judas he would have never allowed christ to die on the cross like that because he just sealed his own fate in not only the earth but in the heavens where where the lord jesus christ has has won on both sides of the coin which is it's amazing but uh if you wanted to just touch on that uh briefly too dave sure so first corinthians 2 7 and 8 says but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, because it was hidden. And then it says, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So you, you made a great point about Luke 22. Satan enters into Judas because Satan wants the cross to happen. And Satan wants the cross to happen even though he knows about the resurrection, even though he knows that Christ was going to die for Israel's sins. But there was one thing Satan didn't know. Satan didn't know that the cross was also going to purchase the body of Christ, which was going to replace him and his minions in the heavens. And if he had known that, he never would have been in favor of it. Now, the, the thing that's fascinating about that, one of the things that people will say about right division is, well, Right division can't be true because there aren't enough people that believe it. And that's just sort of a bad argument, right? Before the flood, there weren't many people that believed the flood, but the flood happened. Uh, and, uh, you know, truth is not determined by majority vote. But I would say this. The reason why people don't believe dispensationalism today is that the God of this world hates it. Satan hates dispensationalism because at the cross, he thinks that something is happening to his benefit, and he doesn't realize until later, oops, with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ's death, he purchased the body of Christ, he's for my successors, and I just sealed my own fate. Amen. And that's why right division, it, it's... it's it is something that when presented to people, it's not something that's easily accepted, but you hit the nail on the head. It, just because it's not uh, widely accepted and it's not widely as something that people are easily believing and teaching, if anything, that in my opinion would mean that you should trust it more because I'm not looking to be part of the bigger crowd. I'm looking for the truth. And if Satan is still in any way having control over it, this world, and we know he is corrupting the gospel, leading people to adding their works into it. Uh, when people come to understanding right division and you understand the gospel, you have a clear picture now of how to get saved. We have a clear picture now of our eternal security. We don't have to walk in condemnation. Satan doesn't want you to know that. He wants you to, to feel every day that, you know, you can lose your salvation because feeling that way, you're not going to be able to be used by the Lord as much. You, you're not going to be able to, to truly go out and preach the gospel if you're doubting it yourself. Um, so right division, it, it completely just lifts up the body of Christ. It gives us definitive doctrine and what we need to know for today. It reassures us of who we are in Christ, that we not only live in him, but he lives in us. Um, and Satan doesn't want you knowing that. And that's why today I applaud anyone who, who is willing to step out on the ledge and preach right division because it's not easy to, to be accepted by others. You're going to take heat, but it is truth. And, and in the end, it's something that Satan's going to do anything in his power to stop being spread. So, uh, you're doing an amazing job, Dave, and you've helped me out so much, but, uh, well, thank you, brother. No problem. One more question that we'll try to wrap this up. Dave, you, you literally, every, I think every question we've had, you probably have an hour long study on it. So like I said, I'm going to have a link to Dave's channel. Go check out his videos. Just sit down one day, you know, or, or throughout a, a course of a couple of days and binge watch him. He's, he's got some amazing, amazing stuff. You'll be blessed by it. Um, we could spend an hour long on each question, but for now, we, I just want to kind of uh, come together and give you guys the basics of what right division is. So um, one last question, being as though we are going to be in the heavens judging angels, when we come across scriptures that, that mentions being kings and priests and the, and the priesthood that's promised to Israel, uh, that's not us in any capacity. We are not going to be priests. Uh, we read about that in the Old Testament, and, and uh, we even see water baptism, and it kind of ties into what being a priest is and, and what it means for Israel. But if you want to kind of just speak on 
is the body of Christ going to be a, a priest or are we a king? Are we going to walk through the, the 12 gates of the, the New Jerusalem? Uh, what exactly does being a priest mean and who's that for? What exactly is that uh, saying when it says a royal priesthood? Is that the body of Christ? Yeah, the, the, the short answer to that is the body of Christ will not be kings or priests on the new earth because we're going to be in the new heavens. And, and probably the best place to start in thinking about that is Exodus 19, verse 6. So at the very, at the very early stage of the creation of Israel, Exodus 19 says this, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. And then it says this, These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So when Moses spoke those words that God gave him, there was a kingdom of priests that was going to be formed. It was a holy nation, but it very specifically was Israel. That's who Moses was speaking to. That's who the promises were given to. We're different than that. So Ephesians 2, 6 says this about the body of Christ, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where we're going to be for eternity is we're going to be in heavenly places. The universe is a big place. So God has a plan for the earth, and that plan for the earth involves the nation of Israel that he made very specific promises to. He's going to fulfill them. God's plan for the heavens is the body of Christ. And so all the blessings we see promised to the body of Christ are that we're going to be in the heaven for all eternity. Those two programs are separate. They're not the same. And, and in rightly dividing the word of truth and in believing the word of God literally, we need to let those things that are separate be separate. Amen. I think that that's a, a great way to end this, uh, this conversation. Let the things that are meant to be separate be separate. Rightly dividing the word of God, understanding if, if you took anything from today, uh, understanding that we get today our doctrine in, in the book of Romans, the epistles written by Paul through Philemon. Um, the whole Bible is for us. We're not incur If anything, you're going to understand when you read Romans through Philemon better when you properly are reading the entirety of the word of God, his entire counsel. Uh, just like we mentioned that royal priesthood, you'll never see Paul ever mention the body of Christ as being a royal priesthood. Um, but that's why it's so important we rightly divide. It clears up all of the, the differences we see in the word of God. It gives us a definitive, clear gospel. It gives us assurance in our eternal security in Christ and who we are. Um, and, and it's just so important today. And, and a lot of, like I said earlier, the videos that I did in the past, I removed because I wanted to start fresh. I wanted to be able to come on here and give you guys truth. And if there was ever anything that uh, was contrary to that, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I'm not in it for, uh, to make, uh, you know, any money off. It. I'm not here to make like, to be Mr. Popular or friends. I'm here for the truth. And, and uh, brother David has been a blessing to me along with so many others. So um, you can expect right division on this channel. If you're interested in, in really just sitting down and learning, uh, I would, I would point you in the direction of brother David's channel. I'm going to post his, uh, the link to his channel underneath this video, uh, start watching some of his videos. He's a great brother. If you have questions, I'm not encouraging you to overflow him every day with, with thousands of questions, but he, he is more than willing to help. And he, he's blessed me so much. And now hopefully uh, I'll be able to, to put out some content that will bless others. So brother Dave, I just wanted to thank you. Thank you for, for spending this, this two hours with us. Thank uh, you, Chris. I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more and I look forward to our conversations. I look forward to all your videos. And um, if there's anything else you want to say before we get out of here, brother, please do. Uh, I'll just say this. Thank you. Thank you, brother Chris, for this opportunity. Thank you for your continual labors, uh, which are longstanding. And, and thank you for your heart for the truth. Um, that is an important thing. And uh, we just pray that your ministry will continue to grow and continue to bless people with the word of God rightly divided. So we, we appreciate your fellowship in the gospel. We want to partner with you, however, uh, would, be, would be good for the body of Christ. Amen. All right, guys. So like I said before, all of uh, Dave's contacts are going to be underneath this video. Please check out his videos. Uh, and I will talk to you guys soon. Take care. God bless.